without further ado, we'll, we'll get started. And the topic for, for today is gender equality in the 21st century. Um, and we'll be taking a particular focus on the Muslim and Christian community, and in particular trying to understand why is it that so few women are in leadership positions um, in religious communities. And we're very fortunate to have three distinguished speakers with us today. Firstly, um, on the left, we have Hola Hassan. So Hola is a writer, a broadcaster, and a public speaker. She's a regular contributor to Radio 4's uh, Beyond Belief. And she's also director of the Albatross Consultancy, which works um, doing research and outreach on issues related to Muslim women. Um, next, we have Shaheen Ashraf. So, Shaheen is a Muslim chaplain at the University of Birmingham. She also leads the, women, the Muslim Women's Network Helpline. Um, and she was recently awarded an MBE for her community work. Um, and then finally, to my immediate left, we have the Reverend Lucy Winkett. Um, Lucy was the first woman priest appointed to St Paul's Cathedral, and she's currently rector of St James's Church in Piccadilly. Um, and she's also a regular contributor to Radio 4 to the Thought for the Day program. So we're going to, each speaker is going to talk for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to open up uh, to, to the floor for questions. Okay, so I'll pass you over to Hora. So if you can just make sure the microphone is turned on. I'd like to start by um, reading a verse from Surah Al Tawbah where Allah Almighty says, Wal mu'minuna wal mu'minat ba'uhum wa'udiyya ba'ah. Ya'muhuna bil ma'roof wa yanhawna anil munkar wa yuqeenuna as-salaa wa yuqeenuna zakaa wa yuqeenuna Allah wa rasoolah ulaika sayarhamuhum Allah inna Allah azizun hakeem. And I think this is very central um, to the issue we're talking about. But Allah Almighty says that the believers, male, and the believers, female, they are awliya, they are protectors, they are friends, they are allies to each other. They order what is good, they forbid what is evil, they establish prayer, they give charity, they obey God and his prophet. On them Allah will send his mercy, because Allah is wise and loving. Now, this is really important because Allah Almighty makes, um, normally in the Quran, Allah Almighty, when he's talking um, to believers, he, he just says mu'minun and that's it, that's believers male and female. But here he makes a specific distinction and says mu'minun and mu'minat. He's talking to both men and women, just don't be sick women, you know, you are included in this. <laughs> and he says, you know, you order good, you forbid evil, you establish a just, good, decent society together, not men do all the work and women sit at home, you both do it together. And where you qimun as and you establish prayer. It does not say where you sadnum, they pray. It says they establish prayer. Establishing prayer means setting up the structures, the formal structures that allow society to be able to worship God properly. And that means establishing a mosque, establishing a madrasa, establishing a community, establishing prayer places, establishing that ease of contact where people can go there and feel that they're comfortable. The first thing the Prophet did when he went to Medina was he established um, mustard, no, he built a mustard with his bare hands, with people, did it himself physically. And not only did he build a mosque, but then he made it a safe place where people were comfortable. There was a lot of dispute resolution going on at Masjid Nabawi. We have a very famous story where a young woman comes to see the Prophet um, in the mosque, you know, he's not there, then Aisha asks her to wait, and she says, my father forced me into a marriage that I'm not happy with, that I wasn't happy with. What can I do? And the Prophet said, I can annul it. Annul it, not divorce, but annul, because the marriage is not um, you know, permitted where she does not give consent. Um, and therefore, I can annul it. And she said, well, actually, you know, we married a bit, and it's not that bad. But um, I wanted people to know, I wanted fathers to know that they can't force their daughters into marriages they don't want, and I wanted girls to know that they have the right to refuse. So look at the safe space that the Prophet has created, where a young woman recently married can come and, you know, without fear 
of backlash from her family, from the community, from her father, be able to say, I'm unhappy. And I am just thinking, given the terrible context that we're in, where we have got grooming cases after grooming cases, sadly, in Muslim communities, um, all over this country, um, and where we have got how many thousands of girls, we can't even imagine, who we know had nowhere to go. And our mosques should have been safe places where they could have gone and said, I'm a victim of grooming, or I'm, a, you know, I'm afraid, or domestic abuse is a huge issue, where women could go, can they go to the Imam? The Prophet was the Imam, he was an elderly man, he was in his 50s. Can they go and say, you know, I need help someone to talk to? I don't think so. Most of our masajids are open only for five prayers, and they'll be open for the evening madrasa, they'll be open for Jum'ah prayer, for funerals, for the eclipse prayer this morning, um, and that's about it. And people don't feel that confidence in going. So I think that's the first thing that I wanted to say, that there is um, so, there are so many problems in the Muslim community at the moment, and the masjid, because the Muslim community, when it came to this, Britain, to this country in the 50s and 60s, they were very good at establishing masjid, very good at establishing mosques, very good at establishing madrasas. They did that very, very quickly. They knew that long term, these were important places. But we haven't progressed. Now, I actually worked with the mosque in East London for about 12 years. And I, I ran a lot of projects. Um, I ran projects to do with, you know, I was a young mother myself at the time. I knew how difficult it was, how um, alienated young mothers with uh, young children were locked up in the house all day, nowhere to go, and it was difficult with small children. Um, and how depression was common, all those sort of issues. So we set up a mother and toddler club, we were looking at elderly people, often, again, alone all day. Um, you know, the younger members of the family going out to work, going to school or whatever, no one to talk to. We set up um, a sort of afternoon club for them. We doing events at the weekend, political events, environmental awareness events, um, you know, um, give blood um, donation organs, all, all sorts of variety over 12 um, years. You know, we did a lot um, with a team, I was under my own. Um, and I felt that I would like to be a trustee of the mosque because um, I was putting so much work into it. Um, so I'm actually, and it was immediately, don't even think about it. Oh. There is a group of trustees, they are all very nice men, I've got nothing to say against them, they're all very nice elderly men, but um, they are the trustees, and for you to come and sit in the same room as them mm -hmm. um, is you know, haram. Um, you know, and I said, well, this is unfair because when I introduce myself, I invite speakers, I'm just running around inviting speakers to come to events. Who am I to invite? You know, I need to have some something to say, well, I am, you know, this in the mosque, and therefore I'm inviting you. Some sort of title. Uh, well, you can be the coordinator for the youth. I can't I'll be coordinator for the youth. Can I come to trustee meetings as coordinator for the youth? to give you feedback of what I'm doing, or because I need some more money for this project, whatever. I'm going to come into the men's area, stay in the women's area, it's a nice area, stay there on your own. So I ran this for 12 years without any interaction with the trustees. <laughs> and, you know, it's just insane. Um, and um, and then I came to my other So, you know, our history um, tells us something very different. The Prophet when he got married, Sadiqa, his wife, was an incredibly wealthy woman. And she gave him all of her wealth immediately. And 13 years after that, you know, she just said, it's, it's yours. Do what you want with it. You know, run this, this new um, project that you've got, this, this new phase, this hour that you need to do. You don't have time to go and work. Here's my money, it's all yours. And the Prophet for 13 years while she was alive had all of her wealth at his disposal. So she's there right at the beginning. Um, Aisha, I mean, who can forget Aisha? You know, after Hadith's death, um, soon afterwards, Aisha arrives. She is one of the great masters of Islamic fiqh, of Islamic ishtihar, of analysis of Hadith. She tells off people like Abu Huraira because she's not happy with the way the Prophet did Hadith. She leads a battle, the Battle of the Camel. She goes all the way to Iraq um, because she's unhappy after the murder of Osman. And she leads a battle. And then, you know, you know she, she sort of suffers defeat and um, embarrassment. But then she goes to Basra. And the whole city of Basra comes out um, to applaud her for her knowledge, to come to learn. And they're not interested in the fact that she was just involved in a horrible battle. They're just interested in the fact that she's Aisha. She's a scholar. She learned at the feet of the Prophet. She is the authority. She gave fiqh pronouncements 
um, and fatawa constantly during the time of all four khalifas. All four khalifas would come, Umar, Umar who was such a great faqih, would go to Aisha and ask her questions about fiqh. And she, and because of the closeness of the Prophet and their intimate knowledge of the history of the hadith and the revelation of the Quran and when and why it was revealed, um, Aisha is there, this beacon of knowledge. Um, and to have that kind of sense that we cannot have women at the front because they are not knowledgeable, they need to be hidden away because the hijab somehow means um, lock them away and throw away the key. Whereas the hijab was very much about giving women public space by saying that you can be in the forefront of whatever. And in Islamic history we see women at the forefront of all sorts of things. Um, Umar Darda is a very famous Sahabi, she um, died in 81 Hijri, so you know, she, very soon after the Prophet And she is an incredible woman of piety and knowledge, and she teaches hundreds and hundreds of students at one, you know, at one time when she's teaching. She sits in the open, she teaches in both um, Damascus and in Jerusalem. She teaches out in the open and she'll be sitting maybe on a, a tree stump teaching and the place will be packed. And the Khalifa, Abdul Malik Marwan, is one of the students. He's a Khalifa. And he is one of her students and he sits on the grass and he listens to her. And she teaches fiqh and she teaches hadith and she teaches tafsir of the Quran and the Khalifa is sitting there listening to her. And there's a lovely story where you know one day she was teaching and then she tried to get out and the azan has been given. And she wanted to get up, and she couldn't, but she was elderly, she was struggling a little bit. So the Khalifa came forward and gave her his arm, and she leaned on his arm, and he walked her very slowly to the masjid. Um, and there she went into the back hall um, to pray with the women, and the Khalifa led the prayer. And I'll just end with something that you would be unfair if I didn't mention it, which is this whole issue about women leading prayer. Um, you know, it would be daft of me not to mention it, because I'm sure most people want to know about it. I'm very conservative. My whole understanding is that if a woman like, uh, like Aisha, who is leading a battle, who is teaching fiqh, who is teaching tafsir, who is teaching hadith, who is teaching, um, you know, aspab and who is teaching everything um, to the Muslim community, does not get up to lead prayer in, in front of the men. If Umar Dada, who teaches the Khalifa um, Marwan, and then goes and prays behind him, they are making a statement that Allah Almighty has chosen um, they're meant to lead the prayer for mixed audiences. Obviously, women can lead women in prayer. That's quite sort of well known. So I'd just like to end with that, that although we, can, we have this quest for improving the whole situation of women in um, Muslim communities, whether it's civic society or religious leadership, both we've got a big problem. Um, although we need to sort that out, we cannot do that by ousting and throwing away a baby with the bathwater and just destroying the fundamentals of our faith and saying, no, no, we just because we need women to be more proactive, we could stick them in front of the masjid and they have to lead the prayer as well. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bismillah, bismillah, wassalatu alaikum. Rasulullah. So my part of the discussion today will be um, on three aspects. It will be the historical context, it will be the current context, and the concluding of both of those. So in the Quran, men and women are created equal and in the here in here here and in the afterlife. In Surah Al Nisa, it states that men and women are created from a single soul, nafs wahida. One person does not come before the other, one is not superior to the other, and one is not the derivative of the other. A woman is not created for the purpose of a man, rather they are both created for the mutual benefit of each other. The Quran teaches love and tenderness and it, that's in Surah Rum between women and men, that men and women are like garments for each other. That be a man or a woman, each of you is an issue for of, each, of the other. And that's in Surah Imran. And that both men and women, they are close unto one another, enjoying the doing of what is right and forbid the doing of what is wrong. And that's in Surah Dola. Understandings of justice and injustice change over time. Within the context of the Quranic worldview of justice and equality, there are many verses that provide a model of relations within the family. And between all human beings, that is the line with contemporary notions of justice. To have justice in our time, and to remain true to the spirit of Islam and its teachings, equality must be embodied in our laws and in our practices. Inequality in family relationships 
and human relations must be placed by mutual respect, affection and partnership. So going into the historical context, most family laws and practices in today's Muslim countries and communities are based on theories and concepts that were developed by classic jurists, which is the Fuqaha, in vastly different historical, social and economic contexts. In interpreting the Qur'an and the Sunnah, classical, classical jurists were guided by the social and political realities of their age and a set of assumptions about law, society and gender that reflected the knowledge at that time, at that age, within that society. The idea, idea of gender equality had no place and little relevance to their conceptions of justice. It was not part of their social experience. The concept of marriage itself was, a, one domina was of domination by the husband and submission by the wife. So let's go into the 20th century. The idea that equality is intrinsic to conceptions of justice began to take root. The world inhabited, inhabited by authors of cl classical juris jurisprudential texts fic had begun to disappear. But in the unequal construction of gender rights formulated in their te texts lingered reproduced in a modified way in colonial and post-colonial family laws that merged classical jurist concepts with colonial influences and negative aspects of local customs. Most of the current Muslim family laws were created through this process and are therefore based on assumptions and concepts that have become irrelevant to the needs, experiences and values of Muslims today. The administration of these hybrid statutes shifted from classical scholars who became increasingly out of touch and were changing political and social realities to executive and legislative bodies that had neither the legitimacy nor the inclination to challenge pre-modern interpretations of the Sharia. But however, I do see and I do observe that there is a paradigm shift that those who do not know their history are destined to repeat it. So stating the same idea in another way, a Muslim scholar once said to me, if you are going somewhere on a train and then you realise that train is derailed then you, and you are going in the wrong direction, you cannot at that moment get off, get back on the track. You must first get back onto the point in which you got off the track and when you get back onto the track, you need to find where you are. Women in general need to know the point at which they became derailed in history in order to reclaim their proper place in the world. I believe strongly that this is possible to equip and empower women to combat the gender inequality and injustice to which they have been subjected for, to, for, for a very long time. Despite the fact that women such as Khadija and Aisha and wives of the Prophet and Rabi al-Basri, the outstanding woman Sufi, figure significantly in early Islam, the Islamic tradition by and large remained rigidly patriarchal until the present time, prohibiting the growth of scholarship amongst women particularly in the realm of religious thought. Thus, the sources on which the Islamic knowledge is based, mainly the Qur'an, the Hadith literature, fake jurisprudence have been interpreted only by Muslim men, who have arrogated themselves to this task defining the ontological, theological and sociological and eschatological status of Muslim women. So, for female Muslim leadership today, <coughs> I believe that full and equal citizenship, including, including participation in all aspects of society, is a right of every individual. The challenge before women in general, and Muslim women in particular, is to shift from the reactive mindset, which is necessary for women to assert their autonomy over their bodies in the strong face of strong opposition from patriarchal structures and systems of thought and behaviour, to a proactive mindset, in which they can fully begin to speak of themselves and many are doing this now as full, full and autonomous human beings who have not only a body but also a mind and a spirit. So what is it that Muslim women want? Who along with Muslim men have, you know, who, who defines that the men are the only vicegerents on earth by the Qur'an, you know, relayed by men? And I understand to be the meaning of their lives. I'm guilty myself as a female faith leader, you know, today, uh, actually I instructed Ramiz that uh, I didn't want to come and speak on this panel today because I didn't feel as though I felt fit fitted into the female Muslim leadership um, conversation but as I have been persuaded I'm here today and I do realise that I do fit into the female leadership um, circle. I mean I was a founding mem member of uh, an, a massive charity which is a charity that is recognised in, in the UK, in USA. I worked in Pakistan and Afghanistan 
I was then designing humanitarian assistance programs for victims of rape in Bosnia. And a lot of my work is to do with sexual violence and conflict. And I do speak on a lot of panels, but not necessarily Muslim panels, because the word sexual has a massive negative stereotype. Before I went on the panel um, speaking about uh, ending sexual violence and conflict, um, in which William Haig had invited me to speak as a faith leader, I had a quote from three Imams saying, Shaheen, you cannot go on that panel because you're a woman and you don't need to speak about sex on a panel to a whole lot of people who are not Muslim. The point was, he didn't understand the concept of what, what I was trying to say. Actually, violence in conflict, I mean, if you look in the world, one in three women are affected by violence. And that is a massive statistic. In fact, I mean, one of us three here on the panel could have been affected by it, if you think of that statistic. It's, it's, it's a difficult place to be as a female faith leader when you're on that level by yourself, or you think you're by yourself. And you're surrounded by men who are making decisions on your behalf. Or when you're on, you spoke about grooming earlier on, um, our organisation, Muslim Women's Network, um, launched a report last year called Unheard Voices, and it was particularly sp speaking about grooming issues and, again, you know, grooming young girls who were from the Asian community and mostly were Muslim girls who were groomed. One of the issues that we came across was, um, in particular, um, in the area where we were, we found a mosque in which a lot of the groomers frequented. We went into the mosque, we asked the faith leaders, we said, you know, this is a mosque that is frequented by individuals who are, who are groomers and the police are well aware of who they are. The mosque then decided that it was going to um, safeguard these men, not the girls. It safeguarded the men. I later went back to the mosque and asked the mosque, why have you safeguarded these men when they are grooming? In fact, we had about 40 cases of girls at that time that were being groomed by these particular men. The mosque said, well, actually, Shaheen, we'd like to say that this, these particular individuals actually fund this mosque. And therefore, you have no basis to come and step on this um, mosque steps and uh, say to us that, um, or even issue us any guidance. And I think that's where I come from, because I am a Muslim, right, right, uh, Muslim women's rights activist, and I have worked a lot in spheres of Afghanistan and Pakistan, including UK. But it's these very issues that I really, really struggle with. It's these, you know, okay, you're not... The rest of the world classes you as a faith leader, a Muslim female faith leader, yet your own could not do that. And that's what I struggle with. And you know, even on campus, I have, uh, we have 26,000 people on our campus, and I'm responsible for all the 4,000 Muslims on our campus, be they Sunni Muslims, be they Shia Muslims, be they you know, Ahmadiyyas, be they whatever. I actually look after all the 4,000 Muslims on our campus. And as a, as a chaplain, I, I negotiate, I bridge build, I'm impartial, I'm neutral. Despite I put all my differences aside and actually look after the welfare of these individuals that come to me day in, day out to help them with their issues. And as one Imam put it to me the other day, he said, well, Shaheen, you may be a chaplain, but you still can't lead prayer. And it's these very, very ideas and these notions that I find challenging. So in reality, we do have positive examples, and I don't want to just give you all the negatives. But we have positive examples. We have organisations like our our own organisation, Muslim Women's Network. I mean, we have examples of what you did in the um, in the mosque, and we have examples of what you do in the church. But we, as a Muslim organisation, are free and we are crit critical because we are not being funded by Muslims. We are funded from organisations like Joseph Landry Foundation. Um, who actually believe in our cause. We are funded by people like Barrow Kashgari, who actually believe that there is a safe space for Muslim women outside the realm of Muslims, which in itself is worrying. So the topic of leadership today repeatedly comes up um, is female representation and leadership. The issue of lead women in leadership has always been one of controversy and throughout history and has remained an intense area of intense debate. 
focusing on the lack of female representation in leadership or positions of authority within the Muslim community, the situation is even more dire. Barring a few women who, have li who are little with more than props, adding little or no substance to the Muslim organisations they claim to be representing, while simultaneously conveying the concerns of not just Muslim women, but also the community as a whole. The lack of meaningful female representation means that the individuals who are called upon to discuss issues affecting the Muslim community are either women who the vast majority of Muslim women cannot relate to, or Muslim men, which is what you see. Um, I recently we did a lot of work again on child sexual exploitation, and um, there is a group of Muslim, a very well-known Muslim organisation that about two years led on, on the child sexual exploitation and grooming. And the the main person spoke, then the president spoke, and as you know, with Muslim gatherings, there's a whole about ten people that speak before you actually get to the point. But um, what had happened was. Right at the end, the president came up to me and said, um, Shaheen, I know we're doing this conference, but what does CSE stand for? <laughs> I, had, I said, you've just got this conference on, and it's on child sexual exploitation, that's what CSE is. And you're asking me, your own organisation is leading onto it. He said, the only reason why we're doing it is, is because it's media hype at the moment. Mm. And we have to look as though we come out when it comes to those very concerning issues that are happening within our communities. And that for me is very, very worrying. Um, again, you know, it's the lack of that meaningful and honest conversation. So it therefore follows that alongside supporting the Muslim women who choose to dedicate themselves to becoming homemakers, those women who are sincerely and who have godly motives, to actually become leaders of organisations, companies or institutes shouldn't have their efforts disparaged. As such, as, as such an attitude not only reeks of maturity but also sets back the Muslim community's efforts to move beyond cultural misogyny and scriptural misinterpretation. It is evident that more British Muslim affairs are currently in a shambolic state, would you agree, I think, um, which is in correlation with the fact that most of the self-appointed leaders for the Muslim community are male. Clearly, their monopoly on a strategy for British Muslims is not working and hasn't quite for some time. This is an unspoken problem in the British Muslim community which may be privately identified but not yet voiced. I just want to say from the, my own experience, it is a crying shame that the top 10 organisations in the UK themselves show very little in terms of gender policy. They show very little, you know, in terms of they do get women on the board but it's mostly tokenistic gesture, um, um, gestures. Um, women such as, as ourselves are also always invited on an all-male panel speaker just to be an MC. Um, and this stems from cultural misinterpretation, guys in the cloak of uh, Islamism. We're not asking for preference, we're just asking for quality and justice that is found within the fundamentals of the Quran. And I believe that actually when women and girls succeed, everyone benefits. A growing number of body of evidence demonstrates that gender equality is not only important to women and girls, it is critical to communities, economies and societies. Educating women causes a ripple effect leading to an increased <coughs> educational attainment across generations amongst both boys and girls. Women with more education have a lower chance of dying during pregnancy and childbirth. Women access so equality information and services, particularly in family planning, is essential to broader economic and health government development goals. <coughs> the benefits of women expanding, expanding women's economic opportunities are equally clear. In addition, women, women's leadership strengthens both public and private institutions by bringing a diversity of perspectives to the table. Women's participation in legislatures, corporate boards and peace negotiations can affect policy choices and make institutions more representative and inclusive. Research shows a positive correlation between the number of women on boards and corporate profits. Evidence also shows that when women participate in priest process, they are more likely to raise issues such as human rights, security, justice and employment, which are fundamental to long-term peace and security. What I believe is advancing full participation for women and girls is certainly a matter of human rights fairness and justice, but it is also a very strategic priority and imperative. One, 
that we cannot afford to overlook in our efforts to promote prosperity and security in the 21st century. Good evening. I feel very honoured to be here uh, this evening. It's fantastic listening to the both of you. And I'm going to speak obviously from my own perspective as a priest in the Church of England, as a practising Christian, and as it happens, as a woman. I've been uh, ordained in the Church of England for 20 years this year. And so the first women were ordained 21 years ago this year. And uh, I could take up my whole 15 minutes with stories of things that have been said over those 20 years, but uh, I won't agree with that. Except to say that I think I have been puzzled more often than not about why the sight, this, I'm deliberately wearing my dog collar tonight, the sight of a, a woman in a dog collar is still so confronting for most of the two billion Christians that there are in the world. So in the Church of England, women are uh, able to lead prayers and we're able to be priests, but that's not the case for most of the Christians in the world. And so we're still in a, in a small minority, you might say. Yeah. One of the difficulties with uh, having women in those leadership positions, and uh, we're delighted that we are here, but one of the difficulties is that women are seen either as the saviours of the religion or the church, so they're going to fix everything and sort everything out. It's all going to be a lot better when women have that uh, have that place. Either that, or that it's a symptom of the decline of the religion, and it's everything that's wrong with uh, with Christianity itself. So what happens is that you get cast as either extreme, and both of those, neither of those can be can be true. Women are not going to save. Uh, the declining numbers of people who are coming to church in the UK right now. We're not going to reverse that by ourselves. But similarly, we're not a symptom of all that is wrong in the church either. Women are fantastically diverse, and there are huge numbers of different views about the place of women in Christianity, in all the different denominations uh, of Christianity throughout the world. So if I, I use just two very simple quotations from scripture, that men and women are made in the image of God from the Hebrew scriptures, and uh, that St. Paul wrote that in Christ there is no male or female, you might ask, why is, this, why is this still so controversial? I was on a panel just last week for International Women's Day. I don't know if you did any, any panels for International Women's Day, but it was last, last Monday. And so I went to a couple of panels in the city so they weren't religious audiences, they, there was a bank, HSBC Bank, and QB Insurance. Don't ask me why I got to go to those panels, but I know nothing about either banking or insurance. But they had a kind of variety of women on the panel, and there was a woman who was a lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy. She was an incredibly impressive person. Then there was me as a priest, and then there was an entrepreneur, and, uh, and there was another woman who was an accountant. And all of us gave our discussions about our own experiences for, as I said, a primarily financial services audience. And afterwards, the most controversial role out of all of us was the priest. Interestingly still, for people who were not really quite clear that women should be doing this. And I was really struck by that, particularly sitting next to uh, somebody who goes to war. But that was a very interesting uh, That was a very interesting. Uh, comment on the, on the audience. So for Christianity, it, within Christianity there are many different ways to interpret our scripture. It's one of the things that Christians love to do, is argue about what the Bible means. But in, in nearly all cases we're taking it extremely seriously when we argue about what it means. So what does it mean when St Paul wrote, in Christ there is no male or female, there is no slave or free. There's something radically uh, equal about that statement, that our humanity is what binds us, and although of course there are differences between us, none of those differences uh, should reflect in the inequality of the power that is expressed, either in public or in private. But in Christianity, the place of women has been hugely controversial, and you'll have seen in the news that the Church of England uh, voted last year to allow women to become bishops, so uh, a leadership role in the church, and the first 
bishop who is a woman was consecrated just last month, Lily Lane, uh, in Stockport. So that was an enormous uh, step forward, but there was still at that service a guy who was able to legally, of course, stand <coughs> up and read out his objection to her consecration. He was given two minutes to do that. And then the Archbishop uh, of York asked the whole congregation, having heard this objection, which the, the guy said was on biblical grounds, having heard this objection, is it your will that she is ordained? And thousands of people just shouted, yes, it is our will that she is ordained. So there's something, there is something still very controversial about it. It gets under people's skin, which I do accept and understand. But we have made huge strides. But we need to avoid being cast as either the best thing that's ever happened or the worst thing that's ever happened. We're neither. For Christians, the sacraments are very important. And this is where I'm going to um, uh, enter the debate that you were just raising about women leading prayer. Because that probably is one of the more controversial aspects of women being ordained, certainly, as, as Christians. So what happened over time in Christian history is that women found a place to be able to speak publicly. In the 10th century, there was an amazing woman called Hilda of Whitby. She presided over a community, a monastery, of both men and women. And she was incredibly authoritative, and bishops would go to her for advice. Um, and she was in Whitby in the, in the north of England. So there are many others. Uh, Teresa of Avila in the 16th century was the only woman known to be called a doctor of the church. She was known to be a scholar. And again, her advice was sought about theology and about scriptural, uh, the, the truth revealed in scripture. So there have been plenty of women over history, I, uh, individuals identified, who have been able to say, uh, we want to make our public contribution to the direction that the church is taking. But on the whole, the expectation has been that women uh, have authority in Christianity, have always had authority in Christianity, but in the private sphere, and that it is men who have authority in the public sphere. And so for me, as I've reflected on the last 20 years, it's that movement from private to public that has been the most difficult within the church for those who object to it to kind of get their head around. So it's women being out in the public square, commenting on the political realities that we live with, uh, commenting on the economic situation, on the cultural mores at the time. That public statement and those public discussions is where Christianity has found it difficult to move women from, uh, that women have moved from private to public. But it's true that in the 19th and 20th centuries, as literacy rates improved, and as women were able to speak publicly about what they found in the scriptures, they were able to do theology. It's really important that women have the ability to discuss with men and with others the theological uh, themes that come out of scripture and out of Christianity. As women's literacy rates improved, their economic uh, situation improved, women were able to move into that public sphere in Christianity and to have those discussions and were able to claim the authority that they believed scripture gave them. So at the altar at St. James's Piccadilly, where I am now, uh, the church is a very beautiful church, it's a very light church, it's got some fantastic art in it, and people will gather on a Sunday and we will celebrate the Eucharist together, we share bread and wine together. The, the place for a woman to be able to stand and break the bread and share the wine and say those sacred prayers that's probably where the controversy has been at its most acute in Christianity. But for the last 20 years, women have been breaking bread and moving their, uh, moving their presiding at uh, meal times and their traditional role of hospitality. That has moved also from private to public. So that women are able to participate in the public direction of religion. So what implications does that have? for the 21st century. Well, I think the things that preoccupy the church today are, uh, are things like numbers of people coming to church. In cities, uh, there are lots of people coming to church. So in London, the church is, is thriving in all its different denominations. But in rural areas, in Truro Diocese, for example, down in Cornwall, there are really serious questions about the viability of small churches in villages. So the church is preoccupied with really huge questions about the faith of Christians, whether they're latent Christians, whether they practice their faith, 
and what place women have in, in articulating that faith in a way that is attractive, that is uh, accessible, and that is concerned with justice. And this is my last point. That justice is contextual. It's always contextualised. So concepts of justice and what we think is just is based on our relationships, because we can't just be just by ourselves. So it, it matters that the church and Christianity has taken on uh, the new insights and the new uh, reflections that have come out in the 20th century and in the 21st century to the extent that we can look at the Bible differently now from how we looked at it in the 15th or 16th century. Even Teresa of Avila in the 16th century, the first doctor of the church, would probably not have said that women could be priests. So that's been an insight that has emerged over time. And because we're a historic religion, we get nervous if we think that things are new and they're coming up, uh, that they haven't been there before. So a big discussion for Christianity has been, can we find scriptural authority for the fact that women can exercise authority in the public square? And we've come to the conclusion, yes, we can. And we found, our, found that truth in our scripture. But it matters that women are in religious leadership. It matters that there are priests in the Church of England, not just because we can do what we like, not just for, for a kind of selfish reason, but it matters to be able to say to women and girls who are coming after us that you are free yourself. You are created in the image of God. And if you are called to lead prayers for your people, then that is something that you should be able to do. Thank you. Um, so we'll now open the floor up to questions. If you have a question, just please raise your hand. Um, and if you'd like to direct a question to a particular one person on the panel, let us know, or we can we can see who's best to do answer. Um, yes, sir, at the back. Can everyone hear me? Hey, just speak up a little. I'm sure we'll be able to. <coughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, very much, Bernice. Um, thank you for your very interesting discussion. I, I mainly have a couple of comments, and if the panel can perhaps comment on that. I think uh, sometimes when we talk about leadership and position, we can conflate the two because you can be in a position of leadership and responsibility without necessarily having the position. And from what all of you have said, you've done great things. The second issue is one of the historical context. Because when these kind of arguments are made, everyone likes to refer to history and saying this time this woman did this and in that time this woman did this. But that itself can be very problematic because uh, the first speaker referred to Aisha leading the battle after the assassination, which in itself was a very problematic uh, event. So it's almost as if we used another example and say, okay, I'm a king and I want to look for an example of kings in the past who killed their sons or the opposition, I could probably find that in history. So I don't think you can necessarily use events in history without the context to justify what women did. And I think there's also, the last comment is that, do you think that there's a safe space now, certainly in the time and place that we live in, for women to organize and fill in some of those gaps that you know, um, you think there are within society. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's, let's address those points uh, one at a time. So firstly, the question about leadership versus position. Would any of our panel care to take that one? <coughs> Lucy, would you like to? <laughs> yes. um, I think that's a really good point because women can exercise influence and for the one better word, power and authority, without holding, without holding the position. That's exactly that's exactly right. But there is, you know, I, I get worried sometimes when there is um, a, an emphasis on men and women being equal but different. That is clearly true. And it's something that I would say is in our scripture, in Christian scripture. Women and men are equal but different. But that doesn't talk about the diverse uh, and different exercise of power within that difference. So. There is, a, there is a problem sometimes with certain positions only being reserved for either men or women if we were living in a, in a different society. And I would say that I think that to express, 
to express that power or that uh, ability to define what's happening uh, it, just in saying that you have to just be yourself or you have to find ways around the edges. It isn't enough in the end. That position does, the position does matter. Uh, but not as the only way of exercising influence, or, or just saying that I think this is the way we should go. Thank you, Lucy. Um, on, the, on the next point regarding historical arguments um, needing to take account of context, um, I think yeah, clearly it follows the best, uh, best place to answer that one. Thank you. Um, I take your point. I think when we, um, I think we have to go into a little depth here, though, because um, in Islamic language, whenever you're talking about ibadah versus mu'amalat, this is the discussion that ibadah is worship. Um, I said this once on a panel; it was a, a really full discussion, and I said something along the lines of, you know, when it comes to worship, this happens. When it comes to Mu'amalat, which are other activities outside worship. There was a, a lovely priest on our female priest on the panel, and she got very irritated by me, and she said, well, I'm a Christian and I'm always worshipping God. So you know, it's sad that you only worship God when you go to the mosque. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but you know when you, when you know what I mean when I say Ibadah, that we are talking about the specific rituals of worship whether it's the five daily prayers, whether it's the Hajj, whether it's the Umrah, whether it's the fasting, whatever, those specific acts of worship is Ibadah. And Mu'amalat are basically anything outside that, so our daily activities. So whether, if Aisha is leading a battle, that is under Mu'amalat. Um, if Umar Dada is teaching a class sitting in the grass on a tree stump, that is under Mu'amalat. But Ibadah are specific acts of worship, and we know that the Prophet every time he gave a khutbah, every time he started his Friday khutbah or whatever, he always said, you know, and he made it very, very clear that anything in Ibadah which has not been ordained by God is forbidden. Because that is the core of our faith, the core, even the central, the diamond of Islam that is the core, is our Ibadah. And that keeps our distinct identity. And when the Muslims flourished, when we had the great Abbasid, the Umayyad, etc., you know, the Mughal empires, etc., um, and they were flourishing and there was expansion, they kept to that core very strictly, but they allowed the Mu'amala to flourish, and that's why we were able to expand. So for, when we come to Ibadah, if we start playing about with that, we are actually at great um, you know, danger of losing our faith. And I think that it's not, it's not a safe place to go where, um, you know, the first question of the Day of Judgment, we know in the Hadith, is about your prayers. The first question will be asked about if you are successful, then it will move, the questions will move on to other things like fasting. And for us to lose that, I mean, I was actually at an event where a lady led a prayer, a mixed prayer, and it was just abysmal. Because number one, um, the Prophet also said when you're praying, you say you stand in clean rows together, you know, foot to foot, shoulder to shoulder, um, and the women, the men are at the front, the women are at the back, and very very neat tight rows. But here we had because you had a woman at the front, and men didn't know where to go, the women didn't know where to go, so we, it was supposed to be sort of mixed um, uh, prayer. Uh, but everybody was uncomfortable. So you had two men and then a big gap and then a woman and then a big gap and then three men. It was like it was just scattered all over the place. I looked at it and I thought, what did the Prophet say about standing, you know, shoulder to shoulder? But I'm not standing shoulder to shoulder with the man next to me. I'm going to be very uncomfortable. You know, prayer is about me standing in front of Allah, concentrating 100%. I really don't want a man standing next to me. It's just very uncomfortable. So, you know, these are issues that we need to think about and say, and I actually said to one of the men that I knew, um, go and repeat your prayer because it's not, I don't think it was accepted and he wasn't too impressed. But I just felt, I was worried for him that he has missed that prayer as far as I was concerned because I don't think he prayed, um, you know, according to the sunnah. So when it comes to Ibadah, we cannot walk away from the sunnah. We just can't. That's why it's there. That's what the Prophet is preaching. Um, and I just think it's very dangerous ground. And what are we achieving? by a woman standing in front of a mixed audience leading the prayer, what have we achieved in terms of women's emancipation? I don't think we've done anything for women's emancipation. Women are still throwing things around. Um, so, and what we're doing is alienating the majority opinion. 
And when you alienate the majority opinion, and the Prophet said, stay with the Jumhur, that's a commandment, stay with the Jumhur. The, the wolf strikes the stray sheep, he said. Now, what is the opinion of the Jumhur in the world today? It is that women cannot lead men in prayer. And what is the Jumhur opinion in history? It's the same. Ibn Rush analyzes it a little bit in the Yad al and he says that the Jumhur opinion is that women cannot lead men in prayer. Um, there are only two scholars that we know in history, um, I think it's al Thawr and um, al Tabari, who allow it, but there are such, um, you know, they're just on their own. Nobody else is agreeing with them in 1400 years of history. How, how can we take that risk with our faith? So, anyway, that's my response. Thank you. Um, and the last question was about whether there are safe spaces for women. And would uh, you like to take that? So, um, I work with mosques and I work with many organisations. And um, so, out of the 1,642 mosques that we have in the UK, I believe, the study was done in 2014, a few, most of those mosques probably a good percentage have spaces for women. But the question you have to ask yourself is, would you as a woman who has been violated enter a mosque to seek help? And me, personally, no. But I don't have, my wings have not been clipped in any way. I have all the freedoms in the world, but I still would not go into a mosque to ask for help. Now, if you ask me, if I would go into my local church, um, which is St. Peter's Church in, in Hall Green in Birmingham, I'd feel absolutely safe there. Because the people in the church are more just to the people that walk into the church than the people that walk into a mosque. I mean, I've seen it where, unfortunately, <coughs> young women have been turned away at mosques. Um, in our own local community, what we've done is we've set up food banks. Um, we have, um, particularly in a community where we work, which is a fairly deprived area, we have um, the mosque provides the food in terms of Askus's congregation to provide the food. The church is the one that delivers the food to the people um, within that community simply because of safeguarding issues. Our mosques don't have safeguarding training, yet there's thousands of young kids that go to that mosque. I have been at the forefront of many issues, and I think the person that set up this organisation, Rashad, he himself, at one point, uh, when he challenged the very mosque that was sexually exploiting children, his family were terribly terrorised by people in the mosque. So you asked me the question, are there safe spaces? I believe there are safe spaces, but I believe that more safe, safe spaces need to be created. You've got lots of Muslim organisations, you've got lots of charity organisations that have been set up. Even the charity organisations, when you give your funds to the charities, I mean, what spaces do they have for their own, you know, their own, the females that work in that, those organisations? Do we have gender policies in place? The people that we go and feed abroad everywhere else, do those, are those people safe? Are those children safe? You know, do we have policies to safeguard those children? So safeguarding, whether it's adult protection or child protection, um, I don't believe those, those things happen within in mosques or institutions that I know. And that's something that I guess we could work on. Thank you, Shane. Um, Anyone else have questions on the floor? Please don't be, don't be shy. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I was late, so I, I might have missed what you said. Um, but and I come here very often, and I always find everything being very natural, and, that, and the, the whole atmosphere, and I always see mixed seating and so on, that doesn't seem to be any problem. Also, I find um, many ladies who have met here, speakers or in the audience, very impressive in the way they conduct themselves, not at all in the un unequal. Um, and uh, I, I'm just wondering, when, when I came here, I thought this discussion was not only about what happens in the church or in the, in the mosque, I thought it was general in 
in business, in professions where people, where ladies are not considered equal. But I have one question to the history. As far as I understand, and I know very little about Islam, the first mosque in this country, I thought, was founded by a convert, a man, yeah. wasn't it? In, um, sorry? Somewhere in, in central sorry. England? Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And was that also already there divided, or was that a more uh, a mixed congregation? And um, I can make a small comment on, on the Christian side, um, that we had very, very uh, serious debates about whether women should be allowed to become bishops, and obviously they have been ordained for, for a long time. And I'm part of a, a, a committee in Kensington, and we have the first case now where a bishop who um, was a very young and very dynamic bishop has been promoted to take over the bishop, as the Bishop of Nottingham and now our, our um, council, uh, we have to decide which next person would be a bishop and we haven't reached that stage but we have three lady candidates who have been nominated to possibly become the first bishop in central London and um, <coughs> As far as I understand it in, in Islam, that is not a different stage, perhaps, of, of development. Um, but is there any prospect of, of ladies becoming imams? I've heard there's something happening there, um, mm -hmm. although it is not a very general tendency here. Yeah, so. So, um, I know that, so, uh, so I'm so, uh, I understand that, that many, mu many Muslims work, help in works in, 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 in mosques and so on. I think they actually do a lot of uh, work for, for the homeless people. It's, it's very impressive. But okay, so, um, I mean, to, so regarding your, just your first, just a factual question about mixed congregations, as far as I'm aware, I mean, all established mosques in the UK would have segregated um, prayer facilities, but that's, that's not unusual as you have to otherwise. Um, regarding um, your question about um, female imams, I don't know if there's much to add beyond what Hor has already said, unless somebody has anything further they'd like to add um, uh, on, the, on, on the topic. I mean, the, the, the traditional interpretation has been that only um, men can lead prayer in, in mixed groups. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, anyone's got, anyone's got anything further to add on that? I think we've probably addressed that um, already. Um, I mean, I'm sure other people may, may dispute that, but I don't think we've got any, um, anyone else wants to talk on that topic uh, on this panel. Um, are there any further questions? Uh, yes, sir. I was uh, extremely touched by the um, references to the Quran and to Islamic history uh, where women had taken active roles and I just asking myself a question and I suppose there isn't a, an answer or maybe the answer is rather too obvious how on earth have the men managed to get away with it and the same would apply to Christianity for so long and is there some some way in which things can be moved faster in favour of the uh, of, of the involvement of all persons male or female within the churches and the uh, and, and, and within Islam as well of course and other religions. Okay, so the, the question there is what, what can we do to, to accelerate um, gender equality in particular in, in Christianity and Islam? Um, would you like to start on that Lucy? I don't have any I don't have a particularly practical question uh, uh, suggestion to make but I I suppose I want to suggest a change in orientation for our decision making. So we're a historic religion in Christianity. We, history is important to us. Jesus is a historical figure. We, the central command of our religion is do this in remembrance of me. So to remember is very important. However, if all our decisions are taken in relation to what has happened in the past, and only in relation to what's happened in the past, then we can't move forward in the, the imaginative way that we could. 
So it, it is possible, I think, to imagine the future that you want, to imagine together, for, for Christians, as we speak for Christians, for Christian women and men, to imagine together what the church looks like in the future, and then ask themselves, what do we need to do to make sure that we can get close to that? So there's an exercise in imagination here, which goes alongside, I think, what uh, honouring the past, which is important for historic religion. But that does require a, a real paradigm shift in how we think about uh, religion, so that things do not always have to be as they are. And the fact that the three of us are here talking tonight, we are living, we are living, breathing examples of the fact that things do not always have to be as they are. And that kind of as a as a way of living and as a way of decision making releases you from uh, what can be in Christianity anyway a rather slavish um, uh, adherence to the history and the stories of the women in, in history. Would anyone else like to talk on that? I'm actually capable of answering this question for about an hour, but I won't. I'll try and do it in two minutes. Um, you know, in Islamic history, we see female scholarship throughout Islamic history. Um, there, there's no shortage of incredible women throughout Islamic history in all sorts of fields of life. The decline is very recent. Um, I would uh, probably, at my understanding of history, the last few hundred years, colonialism was probably the death sentence for female scholarship. Um, and the reason for that is political rather than religious. And what is happening at the moment, I think, with ISIS, for example, and the way they are knocking back women into you know, obscurity, um, it very much demonstrates what happened in the colonial period. Because there was that anger over political events, and this is all political, everything happening in the Muslim world is political, no matter what we're talking about, everything has a political angle and reason behind it. The anger over Western interference during the colonial period and what is happening at the moment with constant attacks on Muslim countries, um, the, kind of the community or the leadership or the ordinary people, whoever is there, you know, they withdraw. Um, there are outside forces attacking us and we need to knuckle down and we need to go back to our original faith and whatever. And sadly, women are the first target because we need to, um, this is the language that maybe ISIS would use, it's not my language. But, you know, the, the Western powers are out to destroy our women, they want to take off the hijab, they want them to be naked on the streets, they want adultery, they want <laughs> marriages to fall apart, they don't want them looking after the children, and we need to preserve the family structure and uh, dignity of women, etc., etc., and we're going to liberate women by locking them up. So that's the logic, <laughs> and, and we're seeing it in ISIS today, and it has been there for the last few hundred years in Islamic history. So um, how do we accelerate it? Um, when Britain and America and France stop forming Muslim countries, we might be able to think for ourselves. That's the problem. Okay, that was more global. I'll go back to UK context. Um, I, I think there is change happening. I think the fact that we're sitting here today, I think it's a, a wonderful example of actually Muslim female leadership coming out mm -hmm. and speaking. Mm -hmm. There are more of us. I think we need to. Um, have conversations with children, um, understand what relationships look like, understand what faith is, understand actually that in UK, and this might be a bit controversial, we need to look at Islam in a different context and understand British Muslim identity, not in the way our parents came, but understanding it from 21st century Britain context. And I think that's where I believe the shift will happen and more young people will be empowered to be part of the faith. Because what will faith look like in 22nd, 22nd century? Really, that's the question we ask ourselves. Will we be in the same state that, as, for example, you spoke about the church in Truro? Will mosques be in Birmingham be in the same state as the, mosque, you know, as the church in Truro? This is what we're asking ourselves. Are our children comfortable with their identities? In this day and age, when you speak about ISIS, no. You know, my own daughter um, has wonderful friends. Um, her, her Sikh friend just about two weeks ago said, um, Mariam, I can't be your friend because my mom said that you might become a jihadi bride. Um, it's just that. I'm a, and 
my daughter said to me, uh, Mom, I'm really struggling with my faith. So where are we and how, what kind of conversations we are, are we having? We need to empower our young children to be happy, fulfilling, wonderful individuals, but only we can create that environment for them. If we're strong in our faith and our identity, and if we understand what British Muslim identity looks like, then I think we can move forward with that. And I think there will be a shift. And there is a, there is a shift, and I can see those moves happening, slowly but surely. It's OK. We'll be leading in the future, I think. You can get the first female Muslim prime minister soon. Yeah. Although I don't think um, the UK would appreciate that. But, uh, yeah. Is there in, in, in Islam any, um, maybe, uh, I have no idea if there is or if not, but are there um, uh, areas in, in, in the Quran, for example, that are clearly um, pro the, the male um, pre predominance and against the women being involved and so on, and which would obviously give some uh, weapons to the to the to the anti women, the mm. anti equality brigade. Because in Christianity, there's quite a bit of somewhat negative stuff here and there. <laughs> there are no weapons. I don't think of. Such a, such mass destruction apart from Surah Al West Is that the one you're going to allude to? Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, as I said, it was a one hour long answer to the last question, and this is part of the answer. Um, but there is one verse of the Quran that is known as the um, Awama verse, um, which is about um, controlling, protection, and mastery, um, in which God says that men are the protectors of women. And goes on to talk about his Arizal of the woman and he said, I'm not talking about the woman at And he goes on to financial issues. So it's very much like a financial issue where a woman with children in the home, uh, the man has a duty to support her. And at the beginning of Islamic history, that was how it was understood. It was very much in a family context that men cannot just have children and then walk away, abandon their wives, abandon their kids, etc. etc. It's a beautiful verse, the absolutely beautiful verse. Over the years, it has become manipulated and it has become a weapon for destruction of women, clearly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, we'll wrap up the questions there. However, hopefully our speakers can stick around for a little bit. Um, if any of you have questions you'd like to ask them, individually. We we'll have a round of applause for all of our speakers. Thank you. Um, and I guess one point maybe I should add at the end. Um, the City Circle has 50-50 um, representation on its board of trustees. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also I think, I think what happens maybe it's a sign of some green shoots that the, uh, the Al Manar Mosque, where uh, City Circle Saturday School takes place, um, has recently appointed a, a female director. So, so hopefully think, things are, are changing. Okay. Thank you, everyone.